crews in southern Taiwan rescuers are frantically trying to find an uncounted number of victims who may be trapped underneath the rubble of several collapsed buildings. Japan was struck this afternoon by a major earthquake. This one is reported to be a magnitude 7.1. Residents here are bracing for more aftershocks. The death toll in the Italian earthquake is rising. At least 250 now dead, nearly 400 others injured. That earthquake in Ecuador, the country reeling from a powerful shock as the death toll rises above 400. So far this year, earthquakes have killed 1,208 people. In the last 30 years, the death toll stands at over a million. The most catastrophic events are those which result in tsunamis or landslides, but more frequently, it's not the earthquake which kills someone, it's the building which falls on top of them. But to understand why buildings collapse, first we have to understand the anatomy of an earthquake. The Earth, when it formed, was very, very hot and when it kind of condensed down and formed different layers as any kind of material condensing would. Think of your glass of orange juice sat on your breakfast table. If you leave it long enough, you'll end up with a thick layer at the bottom and little bits floating on the top and it'll look a bit watery. The Earth's done the same. There's a big iron core in the middle and then there's a liquid layer and then there's something called the mantle. The mantle is solid, but if you look at it over a really long period of time, like a million years, uh, it behaves like a liquid. And then there's a cold bit on the outside, that this, this shell that's protecting everything underneath it. And what, that, uh, what the Earth is trying to do is we've dunked it in space and space is cold. So it's just losing heat because that's all it can do. So all that heat comes from the centre out through the Earth. And in doing so, the inside of the Earth, the bits that can move, try to move. So we see bits of, that rise up and bits that fall down. And on top of that, the crust that we all walk about on is trying to stay still but everything underneath it is moving, so eventually cracks form and it splits and it moves. We call it plate tectonics, but it's just the Earth trying to lose its heat and the knock-on effect is creating earthquakes. An earthquake is a release of energy and it's caused by the movement of things. Now that movement causes a shock wave. Um, and just like you can hear me talking, because there's a wave coming, traveling through the air, and that's the sound wave. Basically, an earthquake is made of sound waves in the Earth, transmitted by just shaking the ground around it, and so it propagates through as a wave, just like ripples in a pond, watching them spread out. These ripples through the Earth are what we experience when an earthquake hits, but it's the frequency of these waves that has the greatest impact on our buildings. To find out more, we visited the University of Bristol's earthquake shaking table. Most of the things that we put on the earthquake table will break because we're trying to understand the failure mode so that maybe we can prevent it or improve its response later on. So we're generally aiming to break things and the table itself can accelerate at up to 6G, so six times the force of gravity. So a tubby guy like myself who might weigh 100 kilos, if I stood on the table and it accelerated upwards for a fraction of a second, I would have my 100 kilos going uh, down that I'm experiencing normally and six from the table pushing upwards. So for that time of acceleration, I would feel as if I weighed 700 kilos and my knees would be much closer to my face than I'd probably like. Buildings all have frequencies that they like to vibrate at. And we have here three uh, models of buildings and they all have different natural frequencies. So if I pluck this uh, smaller building, a little bit like a guitar string, you'll see that it, it vibrates reasonably quickly. If I pluck the medium one, we'll see that this one has a frequency that it also likes to vibrate at naturally and it's slightly slower than this one. And if I go all the way to the taller one and pluck this one, see it's much, much slower indeed. Natural frequencies is an important factor in earthquake engineering because if we have an earthquake that is effectively tuned or has frequencies that are close to one particular uh, type of building, then that building will effectively be amplified in its response. So if we say this is two story, this is three story, and that's a four story building, if I apply an earthquake that's got similar natural frequency to the uh, three story building, you can see that that one is moving an awful lot, but the other two are staying reasonably static. And the impact of this in an earthquake zone would be that all of the buildings that happened to be tuned to that frequency will suffer considerably more damage and collapse.
so we know that earthquakes are most likely to occur along the fault lines of tectonic plates. And we understand how the frequency of these waves traveling through the Earth can impact buildings. But is there a one-size-fits-all solution to the problem of counteracting these forces? Earthquakes vary a lot, so it's not as simple as uh, finding a one-size-fits-all solution that will always be okay in every single earthquake. Obviously, we could build our buildings incredibly strong to avoid any sort of earthquake, but the reality of doing something like that is that it will be far too expensive for anybody to afford. It will be hugely unsustainable. So it's, a, it's about the trade-off between the earthquake engineering side and also the uh, financial side and the um, you know, usability. So generally people want to be able to see out of their structures, so we have put windows in them, etc. So there are things that we need to include in buildings that might not help its strength, but they're a requirement of the building itself, whether we're trying to avoid earthquakes or not. There are over 13,000 earthquakes every year and each one varies in its intensity, magnitude and frequency and we can't accurately predict exactly when one is going to happen. So is it even possible to engineer an earthquake resistant building? The main means by which we go about designing anything, um, but particularly in earthquakes, is to use um, structural codes um, and standards which kind of define the process that you need to, to go through to design something. You have what's viewed as your less sophisticated techniques such as brace frames or uh, rigid frames, but you have a lot more complicated means of achieving the same result. Uh, one of those is tuned mass dampers where you place basically a, a really large pendulum at the top of a building and that moves in a way which can counteract the effects of earthquakes. Or things like base isolation. When you have base isolation, you have um, springs that are between the foundation and the ground floor. So therefore, it stops the earthquake forces from going up through the, the top of the building, which means that the foundation take all of the strain of the earthquake. These are just two of the tools that engineers have at their disposal. But it got me thinking, for countries that have a low risk of experiencing earthquakes like the UK, is it worth us constructing buildings which are earthquake resistant? It would be looking at the severity of the earthquake consequence. Uh, so how many people would die, um, what would the, the cost of the damage be versus the, the likelihood of an earthquake hitting the area. The only one building for the UK would be a nuclear power plant. That's the only real situation where the damage that could occur, even though uh, still relatively small, has potentially very large consequences. So, so we don't like to leave it to chance. And thankfully, we don't have to leave it to chance. Designing earthquake-resistant buildings isn't impossible, but it is an extremely difficult challenge. The odds might seem stacked against us, but with the novel solutions and innovation of engineers around the globe, we can continue to save lives through engineering. Thank you to everyone who helped to make this video possible. If you enjoyed it, please share, subscribe, and check out our previous videos. Thanks for watching.